great pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Dr. Simon Critchley as our next speaker. Uh, Professor Critchley is Professor of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research in New York. Um, he's held numerous guest professorships all over the world and um, has published, of course, wildly, wildly and widely on the field of philosophy and politics. And uh, in his book, Infinitely Demanding, Ethics of Commitment, Politics of Resistance, which was um, one of the inspirations for this conference, actually, and one of the reasons why uh, we invited Simon to, to participate here. Um, he pleads for anger, Zorn in the German translation, as a foundational effect for political engagement. And I found this idea very interesting to take actually an, an emotional reaction as a kind of stimulus for an ethical or for a new ethics um, uh, as a, yeah, as a, as a kind of foundational principle for a new ethics and politics. Um, so please welcome Simon Critchley, who will talk about utopianism and violence to us. Thank you. <clears throat> Guten Tag. Uh, so, vielen Dank für die Einladung nach Gießen zu kommen. Um, Und vielen Dank an meinen guten Freund Gerald Sigmund, immer stylisch, intelligent und gut gekleidet. Gestern war besser, aber... <lacht> Change of Designers. <lacht> und auch an Stefan Hölscher und die anderen Leute hier in Gossen herzlich danken. Uh, es ist meine erste Doppelkonferenzerfahrung. Uh, es ist eine schöne Idee. Uh, und das ist genug Deutsch, vielleicht. Um, I'll address two themes today, utopianism and violence. I'll touch on questions of politics, community, and resistance in art and politics. Not so much in dance, although uh, when it comes to dance, I agree with Gerald. Uh, what Ger Gerald said yesterday about dance and politics, and dance, and war. Uh, the corps de ballet is a corps de ballet. Right? Remember Gerard saying that to me one night at the, the Frankfurt Ballet, watching Forsyth. I was talking about the, the military appearance of the of Forsyth's dancers, and it is a military operation. Uh, but that's about all I'll say about dance. <laughs> um, we're living through a long anti-1960s. The various anti-capitalist experiments in communal living and collective existence that defined that period seem to us either quaintly passé, laughably unrealistic, or dangerously misguided. Having grown up and thrown off such seemingly childish ways, get rid of this, seemingly childish ways, uh, we now know, think we know better than to try to bring heaven crashing down to earth and construct concrete utopias. To that extent, despite our occasional and transient enthusiasms and Obamaisms, we're all political realists. Indeed, most of us are passive nihilists and cynics. This is why we still require a belief in something like original sin, namely that there is something ontologically defective about what it means to be human. The Judeo-Christian conception of original sin finds its modern, modern analogues in Freud's variation on the Schopenhauerian disjunction between desire and civilization, Heidegger's ideas of facticity and fallenness, and the Hobbesian anthropology that drives Carl Schmitt's defense of authoritarianism and dictatorship, and which has seduced significant sectors of the left hungry for what they see as real politique. Without the conviction that the human condition is essentially flawed and dangerously rapacious, we would have no way of justifying our disappointment, and nothing, nothing, gives us greater thrill than satiating our sense of exhaustion and ennui by polishing the bar bars of our prison cell by reading, say, a little John Gray, or even later Dorno, or even in a certain light, Agamben. John Gray represents a persuasive Darwinian variant on the idea of original sin, 
It's the theory of evolution that explains the fact that we're homo rapiens. Nothing can be done about it. Humanity is a plague. It's indeed true that those utopian political movements of the 1960s, like the Situationist International, were an echo of utopian millenarian movements like the heresy of the free spirit could be heard. I've been doing work on the history of medieval millenarianism, uh, following people like Norman Cohn and others. Those utopian movements of the 60s were an echo of movements like the heresy of the free spirit could be heard, led to various forms of disillusionment, disintegration, and in extreme cases, disaster. Experiments in collective ownership of property or in communal living based on sexual freedom without the repressive institution of the family, or indeed, R.D. Lang's experimental communal asylums, or Guattari in France, with no distinction between the so-called mad and the so-called sane, the neurodiverse, the neurotypical, seem like distant, whimsical cultural memories captured in dog-eared yellow paperbacks and grainy, poor-quality film. As a child of punk, economic collapse, and widespread social violence in the UK in the 1970s, it's a world that I've always struggled to understand. Perhaps such communal experiments were too pure and overfull of righteous conviction. Perhaps they were, in a word, too moralistic to ever endure. Perhaps such experiments were doomed because of what we might call a politics of abstraction, in the sense of being overly attached to an idea at the expense of a frontal denial of reality. Perhaps, indeed. At their most extreme, I'm not going to take all my clothes off, by the way. <laughs> I've always had a... I was, I was at a perspiration problem, so that's, that's... At their most extreme, say in the activities of the Weather Underground, the Red Army Faction and the Red Brigade in the 1970s, the moral certitude of the closed and pure community, the co-immunity, if you like, becomes fatally linked to redemptive cleansing violence. Terror becomes the means to bring about the end of virtue. Such is the logic of Jacobinism. The death of individuals is but a speck on the vast heroic canvas of the class struggle. This culminated in her, a heroic politics of violence where acts of abduction, kidnapping, hijacking, and assassination were justified through an attachment to a set of ideas. As a character in Jean-Luc Godard's Notre Musique remarks, to kill a human being in order to defend an idea is not to defend an idea, it is to kill a human being. Right? Tout est non pour défendre une idée, n'est pas de défendre une idée, c'est tout est non. Perhaps such groups were too attached to the idea of immediacy, the propaganda of the violent deed as the impatient attempt to storm the heavens, as Marx said of the communards. Perhaps such experiments lacked an understanding of politics as a constant and concrete process of mediation. That is, the mediation between a subjective ethical commitment based on a general principle, for example, the equality of all, Rancière, love, negri, or in my parlance, the infinite ethical demand, between they lacked an experience of um, mediation, understanding of the mediation between a subjective ethical commitment and the experience of local organization that builds fronts and alliances between disparate groups with often conflicting sets of interests. What Gramsci, and part of my soul always belongs to Gramsci, called the activity of hegemony. So perhaps these groups lacked an understanding of politics as the process of mediation between a subjective ethical commitment and forms of political organization. But are, now I come to my question, are these utopian experiments in community dead um, or do they live on in some form? I want to make two suggestions for areas where this utopian impulse might live on. Two experiments, if you will. One from contemporary art, one from contemporary radical politics. And the two areas can be interestingly linked. Indeed, if a tendency marks our time, then it's the increasing difficulty of separating forms of collaborative experimental art from experimental politics. And I, I find that difficulty compelling. This is perhaps the, 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 uh, the completely, as it were, sensible basis for a double conference on questions of art and politics. Experimental art and experimental politics are at this point, as previously, the history of avant-garde is increasingly difficult to separate. To start with art, perhaps such utopian experiments in community live on in the institutionally sanctioned spaces of the contemporary art world. One thinks of projects like L'Association des Temps Libérés from 1995, 
or Utopia Station from 2003, and many other examples gathered uh, together in a retrospective show at the Guggenheim in New York in fall 2008 called the Any Space Whatever, curated by Nancy Spector. In the work of artists like Philippe Pareno, Pierre Huig, and Liam Gillick, or in curators like Hans Ulrich Oberst, Maria Lind, and others, Nina Mertmann, there is a deeply felt situationist nostalgia for ideas of collectivity, action, self-management, collaboration, and indeed the idea of the group as such. In such art practice, which Nicolas Bourriot has successively branded as relational, branded as relational, art is the acting out of a situation in order to see if, in Obrist's words, something like a collective intelligence might exist. As Liam uh, Gillick notes, maybe, maybe it would be better if we worked in groups of three. So much contemporary art and politics is obsessed with the figure of the group and of work as collaboration, perhaps all the way to the refusal of the work and the cultivation of anonymity. I'm not very good with visual things, but if I were going to do a visual example here, I'd talk about uh, a piece that was done between 2000 and 2003, initiated by Philippe Pareno and uh, other artists uh, called No Ghost, Just a Shell, which I hope you maybe know about. The shell was a, a manga character Anne Lee bought for 46,000 yen after being picked from a catalogue in Tokyo. And different artists as well as writers, and in one case an immunology researcher, were invited to occupy that shell and do with it what they wished. Um, Pierre Huy describes, um, describes Anne Lee as a deviant sign, a deviant sign around which a community has established itself. Right? And I won't go into this now, but I've got thoughts about this in relationship to how the, um, how the, the question of art and, co and commodification. And I, I try and talk about a concept of, um, that I borrow from, <coughs> from, from Liam about, uh, called semi-autonomy. And I can say more about that. But what interests me about examples like No Ghost, Just a Shell is a certain polyphony of collaboration, a collective form of production. And, and anonymity and all the rest. That would have been my visual example. Um, now, of course, the problem with such contemporary utopian art experiments is twofold and it's absolutely blindingly obvious. On the one hand, they're only enabled and legitimated through the cultural institutions of the art world and thus utterly enmeshed in the circuits of commodification and spectacle that they seek to subvert. Right? Even, say, for example, the experiments of, say, someone like Tino Segal, right? they still remain within that institutional framework, respected, gallery opening times or whatever. And on the other hand, the dominant mode for approaching an experience of the communal is through the strategy of reenactment. One doesn't engage in a bank heist, one reenacts Patty Hearst's adventures with the Symbionese Liberation Army in a warehouse in Brooklyn or wherever. Situationist detournement is replayed as obsessively planned reenactment. The category of reenactment has become hegemonic in contemporary art. Everything is a bloody reenactment, specifically, and reenactment as a way of thinking the relationship between art and politics. Now, I like reenactment as much as the next uh, intellectual fraud, but the, there's a sense in which, you know, uh, you know perhaps radical politics has become a reenactment. Uh, perhaps it always was a reenactment, perhaps this conference is a reenactment. You know, I, I could link this to certain thoughts I've got about the beanalization of the world, uh, repetition and all the rest. But fascinating as I find such experiments and the work of the artists involved, in particular for me, Pareno, one suspects what we might call a mannerist situationism, a mannerist situationism, where the old problem of recuperation doesn't even apply because art is completely co-opted by the socioeconomic system that provides its lifeblood. So that's the artistic example. To turn to politics, perhaps we witnessed another communal experiment with the events in France surrounding the arrest and detention of the so-called Tarnak Nine on the 11th of November 2008, and with the work of groups that go work of groups that go under different names: Tikkun, the Invisible Committee, the Imaginary Party. As part of the diminutive Nicolas Sarkozy's reactionary politics of fear, 
itself based on overwhelming fear of disorder and the de desire to erase definitively the memory of 1968, a number of activists who had been formally associated with Tikkun were arrested in rural central France by a force of 150 anti-terrorist police, helicopters, and of course, attendant media. They were living commonly in the small village of Tarnac in the Corrèze district of the Massif Central. Apparently, a number of the group's members had bought a small farmhouse and ran a cooperative grocery store and were engaged in such dangerous activities as running a local film club, planting carrots, and delivering food to elderly residents. With surprising juridical imagination, they were charged with the, the accusation of pre-terrorism, pre-terrorism, an accusation linked to acts of sabotage on France's TGV rail system. The basis for this thought crime, it's like Minority Report, right? was a passage from uh, a book from 2007 called L'Insurrection qui vient, The Coming Insurrection. It's a wonderfully dystopian diagnosis of contemporary society, seven circles of hell in seven chapters, and a compelling strategy to resist it. The final pages of L'Insurrection qui vient advocate acts of sabotage against the transport networks of the social machine. I do this, it's a quotation, obviously. And ask the question, how could a TGV, TGV line or an electrical network be rendered useless. Two of the alleged pre-terrorists, Julien Coupa and Ildun Lévy, were detained in jail and charged with a terrorist undertaking that carried a prison sentence of 20 years. The last of the groups to be held in custody, Coupa, was released without being prosecuted on May the 28th, 2009, although a bail of 16,000 euros was levied and Coupa was forbidden to travel outside the greater Parisian area. We're trying to get into New York in the spring. We'll see if we're successful. Fresh arrests were made in connection with the Tarnak affair late in 2009, such as the repressive and reactionary force of the state, just in case anyone had forgotten. As the authors of L'Insurrection remind us, governing has never been anything but pushing back by a thousand subterfuges the moment when the crowd will hang you. L'Insurrection qui vient has powerful echoes of the situation as international, obviously. Yet revealingly, the Hegelian Marxism of de Boer's analysis of the spectacle and commodification is replaced with very strong echoes of Agamben. In particular, the question of community in Agamben as that which would survive the separation of law and life, and the coming insurrection, the coming community. Everything turns here on the relationship between law and life and the possibility of a non-relation between these two terms. If law is essentially violence, Benjamin's thesis in Critique of Violence, which in the age of biopolitics taps, taps deeper and deeper into the reservoir of life, then the separation of law and life is the space of what Agamben calls politics. And it's what leads to his anomic reading of Paul. It's a tendentious reading of Paul, and I'll come back to that. But if you know the story with Agamben, this is where the book's finished, right? We get the statements like, you know, uh, is it possible to conceive of life in a non-relation to law and law in a non-relation to life? We get a reference to Ireland, a reference to, uh, to Benjamin, divine violence, and then the book's finished. <laughs> the authorship of L'Insurrection is attributed to la comité invisible, and the insurrectional strategy of the group turns around the question of invisibility. It's a question of learning how to become imperceptible, of regaining the taste for anonymity, and not exposing oneself to the order of visibility, which is always controlled by the police and the state. The authors of L'Insurrection argue for the proliferation of zones of opacity, anonymous spaces where communes might be formed. The book ends with the slogan, tout le pouvoir aux communes, all power to the communes. In a nod to the great Maurice Blanchot, these communes are described as inoperative or désoeuvrées, as refusing the capitalist tyranny of work. In a related text simply called Call, they seek to establish, I quote, a series of foci of desertion, of secession poles, rallying points for the runaways, for those who leave, exodus, a set of places to take shelter from the control of a civilization that's headed for the abyss. A strategy of sabotage, blockade, and what's called the human strike is proposed in order to weaken still further our doomed civilization. As the Tikkun group write in a 1999 text called Oh Good, The War, abandon ship, not because it's sheet sinking, but to make it sink. Or again, when a civilization is ruined, one declares it bankrupt. One does not tidy up in a home falling off a cliff. 
That's from a uh, publication called Politics is Not a Banana. In opposition to the an opposition between the country and the city is constantly reiterated, and it's clear that the construction of zones of opacity is better suited to rural life than the policed space of surveillance of the modern metropolis. The city is much better suited to what we might call designer resistance, where people wear Ramones t-shirts and sit in coffee shops saying capitalism sucks before going back to their jobs as graphic designers. <laughs> Such is life in Brooklyn. L'Insurrection is a compelling, exhilarating, funny, and deeply lyrical text that sets off all sorts of historical echoes with movements like the Free Spirit, the Franciscan spirituals in the Middle Ages, through to the proto-anarchist diggers in English Revolution, and different strands of 19th century utopian communism. We should note the emphasis on secrecy, invisibility, and itinerancy, on small-scale communal experiments in living, on the, and also on the politicization of poverty, which I think is a very interesting theme, the politicization of poverty, which recalls medieval practices of mendicancy um, and the refusal of work, which, speaking to an audience of academics, is pointless because you're all, we're all, you know, we're total workaholics. That's a, there's a question there. What exactly does work mean at this point? What is at stake is the affirmation of a life no longer exhausted by work and cowed by law and by police. And of course, this is a definition, a certain definition of anarchism. The double program of sabotage on the one hand and secession from civilization on the other risks, risks, I think, remaining trapped within the politics of abstraction that I mentioned before. In this fascinatingly creative reenactment of the situationist gesture, although I agree with what Jacques said yesterday about passivity and activity in relationship to the society of the spectacle. Right? Maybe it's action that imprisons us rather than a passivity in relation to the spectacle. But in the, this creative reenactment of the situationist gesture, uh, what is missing is a thinking of political mediation, where groups like the Invisible Committee would be able to link up and become concretized in relation to multiple and conflicting sites of struggle, workers, the unemployed, even the designer resistors, and perhaps most importantly, with more or less disenfranchised ethnic groups. We need a richer political cartography than the opposition between the city and the country. Tempting as it is, sabotage combined with secession from civilization smells of the moralism I detected earlier, an ultimately anti-political purism. That would be my critique of this position. But that said, that said, I understand the desire for secession, uh, the desire for secession, or the desire for exodus, as uh, the previous speaker, Isabel, said. It's a desire to escape from a seemingly doomed civilization that's headed for the abyss. Um, I was very intrigued by this idea of constituent immunization in the, uh, this, maybe talk about that, and the, the historical example of Rome, which is, which is fascinating. So understand the desire for secession. <clears throat> the proper theological name for this secessionism is Marcionism, right? is uh, Marcionism. Marcionism turns on the separation of law from life, the separation of the order of creation from the order of redemption, the separation of the Old Testament from the New Testament, the separation of law from love and life. In the face I'll say more about Marcion in a second. In the face of a globalizing, atomizing, biopolitical and legal regime of violence and domination, which threatens to drain, dry the reservoir of life, secession offers the possibility of withdrawal, the establishment of a space where another form of life and collective intelligence are possible. The idea of a group is possible. Secession offers the possibility of an antinomian separation of law from life a retreat from the old order through experiments with free human sociability. In other words, as the, uh, uh, the Invisible Committee put it, communism understood as the sharing of a sensibility and elaboration of a sharing. The uncovering, this is a quotation, the covering of what is common and the building of a force. Now, uh, um, uh, why is there an interest in, no, no, what's, what's going on in the return to Paul and Pauline political theology in much contemporary theory, Agamben, Badiou, Talbez, and the 
publication of Heidegger's lectures on, um, uh, on Paul, which I think are absolutely decisive for an understanding of the early Heidegger. Um, I think it's the temptation of a certain Marcionite gesture. And the genius of Marcionism, uh, just to sketch this, I'm not a Marcionite, right? But uh, the, the genius of it is that we have uh, in Paul, um, in Paul uh, a line that connects creation to redemption. But that, Paul is, that, that line is enormously stretched. Right? There was a God who created the world, and there is this, this, uh, the God Christ who comes into the world to redeem it. That line is stretched. What, what Marcion does is to cut the line right? and to separate the order of creation from the order of redemption and to order, and to order things around two gods rather than one god, right? which gives you uh, the intuitively much more plausible uh, Gnostic conception of creation, which allows a different conception of resistance. Right? So I think What's, what's driving a lot of the interest in Paul is not really interest in Paul, it's an anomic, Marcionite, if you like, heretical reading of Paul, which I can say more about, which I don't discount, but I don't disagree with. I think you find that in a particularly uh, interesting way in Agamben's book on Paul, <clears throat> which is a brilliant book. It's also the case, this is something, this is a, a thought, it's also the case that something has changed and is changing, so I understand the need for secession. But something is changing in the nature and tactics of political resistance. With the fading away of the so-called anti-globalization movement, groups like the Invisible Committee offer a consistency of thought and action that possesses great diagnostic power and tactical awareness. They provide a new and compelling vocabulary of insurrectionary politics that is both described and unleashed a series of political actions in numerous locations, some closer to home, if you see student protests um, where I teach and elsewhere, in German-speaking world and elsewhere, and uh, that's not nothing. The, um, the connection, the word that they, they, they use, which is an interesting word, is the word resonance, resonance. A resonating body in one location, uh, like glasses on a table, begins to make another body shake, right? and soon the whole floor is covered with glass. Politics is no longer, as it was in the so-called anti-globalization movement, a struggle for and with visibility. I think what's shifted here is a certain paradigm of resistance around the question of visibility. No longer a struggle for and with visibility. Resistance is about the cultivation of invisibility, opacity, anonymity, and reson resonance. Which also means a quite different understanding of the relationship to technology, I think. It means giving up the internet for a start. By the by. I have my doubts about the politics of abstraction, severe doubts about the politics of abstraction that haunts groups I'm interested in the way in which um, you know, certain groups have abandoned, have, have began, begun to go back to traditions of pamphleteering, right? Pamphleteering, producing very cheap uh, fanzine-like documents and passing them from hand to hand, right? That's another way of thinking resonance. So you, you produce a little text, whatever it might be, and you hand it to someone who hands it to someone else, and then after two weeks, 20 people have read it. I think that's interesting. Also, what, what comes back is the question of number. I think we've become bewitched by a certain uh, scale of protest, right? Big protest is, is, as it were, necessarily good. Why? Why is that the case? Okay. I've got my doubts, severe doubts, about the politics of abstraction that haunts groups like the Invisible Committee. But if we reject such political experiments, then what follows from this? Are we to conclude that the utopian impulse in political thinking is simply the residue of a dangerous political theology that we're much better off without. That's what we're supposed to think, right? Is the upshot of the critique of utopianism that we should be resigned in the face of the world's violent inequality and updated belief in original sin with a reassuringly miserableistic Darwinism? Should we reconcile ourselves to the options of political realism, authoritarianism, or liberalism? John Gray, Carl Schmitt, or Barack Obama? Should we simply renounce the utopian impulse in our personal and political thinking? If so, then the consequence is clear. We're stuck with the way things are, or possibly with something even worse than the way things are. 
To abandon the utopian impulse in thinking and acting is to imprison ourselves within the world as it is and to give up once and for all the prospect that another world is possible, however small, however fleeting, however compromised such a world might be. In the political circumstances that surround us presently in the West, a term that I hate, to abandon the utopian impulse in political thinking is to resign ourselves to liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is the rule of the rule, the reign of law that renders uh, all the juridical uh, immunity, the, the, uh, the reign of law that renders impotent anything that would break with law, the miraculous, the moment of the event, the break with the situation in the name of the common. It is a political deism governed by the hidden hand and divine hand of the market. My point is that other forms of political life are possible. Right? And here, if I were going to, if I, you know, more time, it's always a lie, of course, I don't want more time, and I don't want any questions, obviously, but the, I welcome your questions. Right? But the, the point would be, uh, I'd like to, I'd expand here and think about this in relationship to the logic of sovereignty in, in Bataille. This point came up with uh, Juliana's question this morning. I think there are different ways of conceiving of sovereignty. And I've been reading recently the third volume of uh, uh, La Part Maudite de, uh, of Bataille and thinking about sovereignty as in relationship to impossibility. And in Bataille's formulation, which I'm sure you know, is that sovereignty is impossible, yet there it is. Right? Impossible, yet there it is. And um, that's that. Now, are such questions of, are such, uh, is a utopian impulse in thinking possible without violence? And that's the question I want to turn to now. Violence, take a glass of water. Who are these characters on the walls? Who are these? <laughs> Who are these? I'm just surrounded by these strange, bizarre characters. <laughs> okay. Violence is not reducible to an act in the here and now, which might or might not be justifiable in accordance with some or other conception of justice. Right? On the contrary, violence is a phenomenon that has a history. Right? Violence is a phenomenon that has a history. It's never a question of a single act, but of one's insertion into a historical process saturated by a cycle of violence and counter-violence. Violence is always a double act. Violence is a double act between human subjects, human subjects whose experience of violence interpolates them in a repetition effect from which they cannot free themselves. Right? There's a formulation So violence is not one thing. Violence is a double act, uh, which interpolates subjects in a repetition effect from which they cannot free themselves. Consider the overwhelming evidence of colonialism. Violence is never an abstract concept for the colonized. Historical amnesia and incuriousness about vi the violence of the past are, is the luxury of the oppressor. The colonized subject lives the historical violence of their expropriation viscerally corporeally, all the way to psychosis, mental disorders, and phenomena like possession, as Franz Fanon shows in detail. No word seems more often used in The Wretched of the Earth by Fanon than the adjective muscular. Violence is the muscular assertion of the colonized against the colonist in the context of a national struggle for liberation. Violence is the absolute praxis, a cleansing force, driven by a ravenous taste for the tangible. It's through violence against the colonist that the colonized subject can get rid of their deformed inferiority and liberate or literally remake themselves. Fanon writes, decolonization is truly the creation of new men. I have deep suspicions about the idea of violence as a cleansing force. The heroic, virile assertion that violence is that healing, bloody crucible through which men, men are redeemed and remade, where the colonized thing becomes a free man through what Sartre calls the patience of the knife. Nor am I persuaded by Sartre's hyperbolic dialectic, where killing a European is killing two birds with one stone. In one violent act, the opposition of oppressor and oppressed is aufgehoben, and the formerly colonized subject, for the first time, feels a national soil under his feet to quote um, from Sartre's preface to Fanon. This is a glorification of violence that wildly exceeds Marx, Sorel, or Lenin, and is perhaps 
as Hannah Arendt notes, Santa Hannah as we think of her, caused by the severe frustration of the faculty of action in the modern world. And you can think about, you know, uh, a certain contemporary discourse on violence as being uh, precipitated by frustration of action, which leads to increasingly mannerist um, exaggerations of violence. Ergo Zizek, right? We could, get, we could talk about that if you want. However, what remains irreducible in Fanon is the understanding of violence as a lived historical experience of expropriation whose effects constitute the daily humiliation of the wretched of the earth. When violence is understood in this way, there is no doubt that principled assertions of nonviolence simply miss the point. Worse still, nonviolence can be an ideological tool introduced by those in power in order to ensure that their interests are not adversely affected by a violent overthrow of power. Nonviolence here becomes a negotiating strategy, or a, a blocking strategy, or a media strategy. As Fanon writes with withering irony, nonviolence is an attempt to settle the colonial problem around the negotiating table before the irreparable is done, before any bloodshed or regrettable act is committed. And as ever, Sartre makes the point more colorfully in a, in a more exaggerated way. Get this into your head, Sartre says. If violence were only a thing of the future, if exploitation and oppression never existed on earth, perhaps displays of nonviolence might relieve the conflict. But if the entire regime, even your nonviolent thoughts, is governed by a thousand year old oppression, your passiveness serves no other purpose but to put you on the side of the oppressors. History is a seemingly endless cycle of violence and counterviolence, a repetition effect. And to refuse its overwhelming evidence in the name of some a priori conception of nonviolence is to disavow history in the name of an abstraction that in the final analysis is ideological in the bad sense. There are contexts where a tenacious politics of nonviolence, such as Gandhi's Kropotkinesque strategy of Satyagraha, can be highly effective. There are contexts where a mimesis of Gandhi's tactics might also prove successful, as was the case for several years in the civil rights movement in the US in the 1960s and the words and deeds of Martin Luther King. There are contexts where techniques of direct action that David Graeber calls nonviolent warfare nonviolent warfare may prove effective and timely. There are contexts where a difficult pacifism that negotiates the limits of violence might be enough. <clears throat> but there are contexts, multiple contexts, too depressingly many to mention, where nonviolent resistance is simply crushed by the forces of the state, the police, and the military. In such contexts, the border separating nonviolent warfare to violent action has to be crossed. Politics is always a question of local conditions, of local struggle, and local victories. To judge the multiplicity of such struggles on the basis of an abstract conception of nonviolence is to risk dogmatic blindness. So this is the question, this is really my question. I mean, what I'm trying to think about here is, is um, to what extent um, to what extent a commitment to an ethics and politics of nonviolence has to, as it were, forgo that commitment and engage in processes of violence. That's really my, my thought. And if you know some of my stuff, you'll realize there's, there's, there's a change of position here. I'm trying to think something through without necessarily knowing whether I'm right or not, but it's just a, it's an experiment. Uh, does a commitment to nonviolence exclude the possibility of violence? That is the question. <clears throat> Walter Benjamin writes in Critique of Violence, every conceivable solution to human problems, not to speak of deliverance from the confines of all world historical conditions of existence obtaining hitherto, remains impossible if violence is totally excluded in principle. Right? Every conceivable solution to human problems is impossible if violence is excluded in principle. It's that in principle that I'm focusing on. We cannot expect a radical change in the state of human beings in the world if we exclude violence as a matter of principle. Benjamin is making a crucial point. In the political sphere, it makes little sense to assert and hold to some abstract, principled, or a priori conception of nonviolence. As is well known, 
the standard objection to anarchist uses of political violence always turns on this point. It will be said, quote, how can you justify, justify your use of violence? Shouldn't you be committed to nonviolence? If you resort to violence, don't you begin to resemble the enemy you're fighting against? You know how it goes. Of course, nonviolence, conceived of as the domain of cooperation and mutual aid, the life of the social bond, you know, Kropotkin, Gustav Landauer, Malatesta, this is Benjamin's realm of courtesy, peaceableness, and trust, is both the presupposition and aspiration of anarchist politics. But why should anarchists be the only political agents who have to decide beforehand that they will not be violent, when the specific circumstances of a political situation are still unknown? To this extent, the abstract question of violence versus nonviolence, the philosophical question, risks reducing anarchism to what we might call the politics of the spectator position, where nonviolence becomes a transcendent value, an abstraction, a principle, or a categorical imperative. In specific political sequences, and it's always and only a case of such specifics, a locality, a series of actions, an eventual site, as Badiou would say, the turn to violence is often entirely comprehensible. The violence of protesters, critics, and opponents of a regime is usually, but not always, but usually a response to the provocations of police or military violence. So that's a question that you know, I, I, I've, uh, I'd like to think more about. But let me come to a conclusion, which uh, might or might not follow from what I've just said. To conclude, um, at the end of his critique of my political position, uh, Slavoj Žižek, in a text called Resistance is Surrender, which is a revealing title, raises a criticism that seems initially powerful. Žižek says against me, the lesson here is that the truly subversive thing is not to insist on infinite demands. We know infinite demands those in power cannot fulfill. But on the contrary, to bombard those in power with strategically well-selected, precise, finite demands which cannot allow for the same excuse. Right? So that seems like a reasonable critique, right? um, prima facie, as it were. But Zizek gets it exactly and interestingly back to front. In political action, it's not a question of issuing infinite demands that cannot be fulfilled. By their very exorbitance, such demands can easily be tolerated by being ignored. What is infinitely demanding, rather, is the ethical disposition of being open and attentive to what exceeds the finite situation in which we find ourselves. So what's infinitely demanding is a disposition of attentiveness to what exceeds the finite situation in which we find ourselves. So infinite here does not consist in the demands that I make, but in finding something in the situation that exceeds its limits. That's the point. There's something about the situation which exceeds its limits. There's some possibility there. Infinite demands are not issued by a subject, but are the mark of the subject's responsiveness to and responsibility for what is unlimited in a situation. What is unlimited in a situation. In a concrete action, uh, a wage dispute, say, or... Um, you know, a struggle for autists' rights or whatever, in a, in a, with a, you know, in a concrete situation. Um, we might indeed, as Zizek recommends, begin with a finite demand, right? the demand for a living wage, the right to join a union, or the demand for a decent education, um, or whatever. Such a demand can either be accommodated or not, and that might be the end of the matter. The problem with restricting struggles to precise, finite demands is that once those demands have been met or ignored, then the struggle is at an end. Such is the politics of accommodation, and the politics of accommodation conceived of in the surface of the state for someone like Zizek, and I, that's his Leninism, and I, I disagree with that. But there can also be a politics that refuses to be satisfied with accommodation at the level of the state or government. In such political actions, the finite demand around which a struggle organizes itself extends itself beyond the limits of the identity of the concerned group and becomes something more radical and far-reaching. In this way, the concrete struggles of particular groups 
and interested parties defined by region, ethnic identity, or disability, say, can rapidly become radicalized and perhaps place in question the entire governmental framework or socioeconomic state of the situation. I mean, to go back to what Erin and Brian were talking about yesterday, you could, we have a, a discrete finite demand in relationship to how uh, uh, people with autism, that diagnostic category, should be treated in terms of education and all the rest. But that finite demand might become the basis for an articulation which begins to invert the whole um, relationship between the normal and the pathological. Right? And if we begin to conceive of the distinction between autism and non-autism, not as a division or a line, but as a scale, then one could imagine, in terms that you were presenting yesterday, that neurodiversity becomes something infinite in a situation, which might take a lot more people along with it. I think that's an example of how politics might work, right? Um, so it's not a question of, as it were, making infinite demands that are going to be rejected, but of, as it were, of, of, of making finite demands which allow something unlimited in the situation to take shape. That's my, that's my point. I'm almost at the end. By limiting oneself to finite demands, one loses the radical potential of struggles to extend beyond their particularity, to link with other struggles in other locations and become generalized. And obviously it's the generalization of struggle that is, is of interest here. Uh, a brilliant student of mine that I want to know, uh, cite because I plagiarized from him, Jacob Blumenfeld, is trying to do this in terms of a, a generalized history of rioting in the United States. Looking at examples of, as it were, precise, finite uh, examples of riots from the 19th century onwards, and showing how uh, you can, it's sort of an, eth an ethnography of the riot in the, in the 19th and 20th century. It, it's very interesting, and the way in which, as it were, a specific finite demand, you could think about this in relationship to the um, you know, specific examples, the Democratic Convention and the, um, oh, it's the jet lag is getting my mind, the Rodney King example, precipitates, as it were, uh, uh, the possibility of a generalized struggle. That's another example. Um, or again, you know, the, 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 the history of the, the occasion of rioting that happened in around questions of you know, race in, um, in England in 1981 and 1982, uh, at the moment of uh, Thatcher's exertion of hegemony and uh, the rise of the new right in England. And then, anyway, we could talk about that. It's, uh, it's as if there was a, a, an almost spontaneous interconnection between different locations of protest, and that's what interests me. What is infinite, so the key to any genuinely emancipatory politics consists in an openness to the possibility of a generalized struggle that exceeds any particularity or any claim to identity. So identity politics is always, always going to be fractured. What is infinitely demanding is that process by which specific, perhaps self-interested or defensive struggles become something else. They open onto something hitherto unknown about the situation in which one finds oneself. What is infinitely demanding then is this ethical commitment towards a possibility as yet unknown and inexistent in the situation, but still powerfully imagined, a utopian moment. The infinite demand, and I'll finish with this, is a double May ontological demand, right? Uh, May, uh, Tom Mayon, you know, the, the, the idea of nothing. A double May ontological demand, to see what is in terms of what is not yet, and to see what is not yet in what is. Right? To see what is in terms of what is not yet, and to see what is not yet in what is. It's a formula. Such is the implication of taking up a utopian standpoint. This means embracing, and this is new for me, embracing a double nihilism. Embracing uh, an affirmative nihilism. Both what Benjamin calls in the theological political fragment the nihilism of world politics, in our times, neoliberal capitalist globalization, whatever that means, uh, and trying to focus attention on that which has no existence in such a world, uh, in such a world politics, uh, the experience of association without representation, uh, the experience of something that uh, anarchism has been trying to describe in its, in its history. Um, politically, the demand exerted on us by the finite context 
exceeds the content of any finite demand that might be accommodated at the level of the government and the state. Literally speaking, the infinite demand is nothing, but it's a massively creative nothing. Ich danke Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Beautiful um, and uh, important. I really enjoyed that. Um, <clears throat> so I have a, a, I guess, a comment, a thought, sort of thinking with you. It's not resolved into a question yet. But um, a lot of the work that um, I've been doing and that uh, the the group that we have in Montreal called the Sense Lab does is really around these questions. And my students have been asking me these past couple of years whether we need to rethink violence and this is really coming from as I think you were articulating really well a desire for standing in the in the, in the place of nonviolence and wondering whether that place of nonviolence was precisely allowing for a certain kind of passivity and spectatorship and also wondering what whether we might be able to think violence in a way that is not yet recognizable as violence so I mean to what extent the violent could be thought as a cut in the in the sense of decision um, that Whitehead, for example, brings. You know, where Whitehead says that, as Schmidt does, but in a different way, that the decision is itself a cut. And so, really, what what was and and you know, your critique of Zizek was fantastic. Um, so the infinite is exactly where we've been trying to think, and perhaps the what has come up recently is the question of the passage between art and politics where the artist no longer recognizes herself as an artist. So where, where the moment comes that the, that the work at hand puts the collective in a position that what they are doing no longer figures in the art world, no longer has a place in the art world, can no longer be subsumed by the art world because it doesn't produce for the art world anymore. Uh, because it becomes writing or because it becomes teaching or because it becomes something else, right? And so um, the, the, the question that I would ask you, uh, but it's sort of a, a, an enormous question, but maybe you've had some thoughts, are, are about what, what we call the techniques. Like what, what would be techniques for, for cutting into this uh, question of the infinite? Um, you know, is there, other than perhaps the few artworks that you mention or Takun, yeah. have you thought about sort of modalities at the micro-political level, not, you know, that, that are, have been, um, you know, f f potentializing in that, in that regard? Yeah. Um, well, I think, I mean, you know, that the, um, I was thinking about what you were saying yesterday, and I was, uh, you know, and, um, uh, I mean, think about the way in which the question of autism has become a political issue in the last last few years, right? Um, is astonishing. And um, that, as an example of, you know, and the question I was going to ask you, which is, we, we, we talked about last night very briefly, is, you know, whether the spectacular rise in cases of, 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 of autism, say in um, Silicon Valley and certain metropolitan areas, is a case of actual rise, rise, rise in the case of autism or whether it's a consequence of the diagnostic uh, categories that are being used and, the, and the, as it were, uh, the medicalization of autism. I think it's probably the latter. But that would be an example of, you know, of, of, of an issue which then becomes, to use a bad word, verbalized, visualized, articulated, mediatized through the Temple Grandin movie or whatever it might be, and then and then, you know, that, that sliding scale separating uh, the autistic from the non-autistic, the normal from the pathological begins to, to break down. And then, for example, this, uh, this little um, column I run, uh, there's a friend of mine called Andy who's just written a piece on autism and philosophy, uh, looking at, you know, <laughs> the undeniable case of, of major philosophers like David Lewis 
or Wittgenstein, who are clearly, you know, in some sense autistic, and they, they, see the, they see the green, they see the checkered patterns, they see the detail on the floor before, the, before they see the faces, and the way in which, you know, certain forms of uh, philosophical creativity or conceptual creativity could be, as it were, now, then you've, begun, then you've begun to have a very different debate about this phenomenon, right? It begins as, as a phenomenon about, well, rights for people who are diagnosed as autistic. We begin with that. And then we begin to redescribe the culture with a different set of, a different vocabulary. That would be you know, an example. I mean, as it were, I mean, the, the artist examples, I, I mean, I'm not very, um, I'm hopeless. I don't like going to galleries very much. And I like going to openings because you get free drink, but the galleries, I, but then the, the openings, you never see the work. But I suppose my, my relations with the art world are just occasioned by friendships, right? So that someone like, or, or people I work with, so, um, and they're limited in that regard. So what I like about, say, Philippe Parreno is someone that I've, I've worked with, is just his, his curiosity about um, association. Right? He just wants to, there, there's a sort of a hunger to collaborate. Right, and to do things and to bring about situations which you know, will use, as it were, the space of a gallery or something and then try and make something, bring something around. And that would be, um, that's, what, that's what interests me. I mean, did this remark you know, the, the, um, of, 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 of Oberist about a collective intelligence, that's really what interests me. But thanks. Simon, I want to go back to the uh, first talk, uh, first part of your talk. Um, <laughs> That's right, the first, you know, the first talk is absolutely right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> double conference, double talk. <laughs> oh, I have a question towards you. Uh, but start with, a, uh, with very quick anecdotes concerning uh, Tikkun, Invisible Comedy, and, and the coming insurrection. Uh, starting with the reception of the, the book. Uh, when it came to New York in the in the in the English translation, it caused a little scandal, uh, at least in the mainstream press. It went even to Fox News. These dangerous uh, French uh, European people are a real revolutionary threat to to yes, and that was nice. Uh, uh, and it also helped to to sell the book. Um, yeah, semi attacks were very happy. I understand. Yeah. Uh, and. Then it uh, uh, was published in, in German like some weeks or months ago. Uh, yeah, and one thing is that uh, there was a, a very nice uh, affirmative uh, uh, review in Süddeutsche Zeitung. Yesterday. So <laughs> yesterday. Uh, really? And I it's, need to read that. Uh, you see what happens? It's uh, uh, kind of uh, nice uh, review here in Germany. Uh, and uh, the only point that is a bit criticized is about violence, okay. Uh, uh, and the other uh, small anecdote is uh, that the German publisher, it's a small Hamburg uh, publisher, when they published it, they asked, I, I, I won't, I wouldn't want to say it, but uh, because the, the, the story is, Curious, is a bit bad. Uh, they asked uh, the, the people who did the unofficial uh, translations like two years ago uh, to put them off the website. These are activists and uh, it, was, it became a copyright, not a case, but in a way uh, an issue of copyright. And that, that's really funny with uh, this kind of revolutionary uh, yeah. pamphlet. Uh, but my question is more than... Uh, related to the small uh, aspect of visibility invisibility because Thanks. here i see the you can see the, the the problematic which you were not uh, calling like this you were more hinting at the agampen problem in tikkun but there is also another problem for me it's uh, de boer uh, and the society of the spectacle uh, right. in the background uh, and with this pathos of uh, of uh, de boer uh, I think there is the, the, the this is the, the ground also for the um, hypostasizing of invisibility. Uh, it's not a Deleuzean idea of becoming imperceptible or uh, becoming invisible, but it's more uh, an essentialized idea of uh, yeah going back to the country, uh, forming an, a commune, and uh, making a clear uh, rupture between the society and me. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and I think that's uh, maybe my just one sentence concerning my own perspective. Uh, I think there must be a kind of uh, like the mole, the Marxian mole that comes up from time to time. Uh, there has to be a connection between visibility and invisibility. So even in the practice of Tikkun and, and the Invisible com Committee, there might be such a connection be because at least the discursive uh, um, products of them uh, are clearly uh, visible. Yeah. That's it. I mean, the, it's, yeah, the obvious paradox, which is true, is that the invisible becomes visible insofar as it, it surfaces in terms of um, a book and then, you know, the reception in the United States, which was... Um, you won't all be aware of this happily, but the uh, Glenn Beck, who is a hugely influential uh, Fox News uh, pundit opinion, and also a very important political figure in the US, who fascinates me, on two occasions picked out this book and waved it in the air and um, said, look, this is what these people in Greece are after. It was at the time of the, uh, the, the, the riots in Greece in, um, in May, I think it was. So the sense in which, obviously, you know, the invisible becomes visible, or again, you know, the more that you cultivate invisibility, the more that people will want visibility, right? So what I like about, say, Tino Segal's work is the refusal of any documentation. Of course, everybody wants documentation, right? People are in there you know, taking photographs of things and, and whatever. So as it were, nothing is better for visibility than invisibility. But there's a, there's a, a more serious point, which is that the... Um, you know, the, uh, the, point about, oh, the point about the hypostasization of the invisible, yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with that. I mean, that's what I was calling Marcionism. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I, I, to, get, to make it clear, I'm not celebrating uh, the, the coming insurrection, right? I'm, I'm reading it. I'm not, uh, and the context is the context, that, I mean, the, the, the discrete local context is one where there was a, a series of events at the place where I work where the students were uh, reading this thing in French and translating it and distributing it to other students and it became, as it were, the, the, the act of translation and giving pamphlets from one person to another became a political act. And they were in, it's, it's, you know, and, and maybe it's, it seems naive to some of it, but I, I like the naivety. I mean, I love the naivety of it. They were up all night, you know, translating the text collectively and then printing out poorly finished versions of it, handing it one to another. And the reception uh, from the so-called, you know, uh, critical theory left at places like the New School was nothing but one of uh, hostility. And uh, either a sort of utterly patronizing, well, we did this in the 1960s, we were anarchists in the 1960s, but kids grow up, you know. Or, or, a, or a sort of a hostility, which was, you know, obviously what you expect from critical theorists. I mean, call the police at the first, the first instance, what they always do. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you know, something terrible might happen. So, and, so it's against that, that I, you know, I think this has to be, this gesture has to be taken seriously, right? Uh, it is touching something which is, which is real and uh, of, of concern. I'm not, uh, I mean, my critique of it is you know a very straightforward critique is that is that politics requires two elements it requires something like uh, something like a, an ethical axiom right uh, and it requires uh, a, a, a subjective commitment to that axiom and it requires some conception of organization right and the problem of tikkun and those groups is uh, the failure to do that and to retreat into an anti-political moralism right which we know, we know very well from the history of the radical left, right? So that's, that, that, there's a critique of it there, but it has to be taken seriously, I think. Um, and the question of violence, yeah. And de Boer, I mean, I mentioned in passing, this is a point that also uh, Alberto Toscano makes in his review of the uh, coming insurrection, is, is it's interesting to note the way in which the Hegelian Marxism of the underpins de Boer's analysis drops out and is replaced by an Agambenian diagnosis. So it's, it, and that's, that's of interest. Sorry. Oh, God. I'll be brief as well. Sorry. Yeah.
So, um, a short question. Thank you, um, Simon. Thank you for elaborating, of course, on the concept of uh, violence. Um, you refer to your book Infinitely Demanding, and you have to, of course, in making a difference between um, usual business politics and a, m a different kind of politics. You described it today um, with the words, and I quote you now, it, it happens something more far-reaching and more radical, more radical and far-reaching when we, our politics is based on infinitely uh, demanding. Mm -hmm. Question now is, is this description something more radical and far-reaching happens? A transcription of the classical term universal? And if so, why is this the case? Why does a demand that which is based on an infinitely demanding political philosophy has to be a universal one. Um, it depends what you mean by universal, right? <clears throat> I don't mean universal in the sense of uh, common to uh, all human beings or that which um, is in principle shareable by all human beings necessarily, right? In sort of anthropological sense or whatever. Y the universal is something that can be uh, constructed in a, in a situation, right? Which means that, I mean, this is, this is my, my covert Rousseauism, if you like, uh, despite what was said about him this morning, which I accept, you know, that there's, there's two elements in a legitimate politics, uh, a question of, uh, of locality, a question of, of scale, um, which for him is always a question mark, and then a conception of the general, right? the general will or whatever. And politics becomes the activity of the construction of um, the general in a locality. Right? So, um, so for me, um, so, f so for me, uh, politics is about the, um, uh, this, this also, you know, I don't know where this came up. That was something else. It, politics is about the um, construction of, of sites for something like the general will. And that's why, I, for example, this is strongly anti Arentian in its, uh, in, its, in its emphasis. I find that there's, all, and there's a sense, and, what, and also what's motivating that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, that's good. Shouldn't mention Hannah Arendt. Yep. Discipline. Simon, I, I very much appreciate your giving us a way of sort of re revalorizing and rethinking the, the student occupationist moment, which I, I think is also itself a kind of bridge b between the artistic examples, you know, of a kind of installation uh, and, and, and the utopian moment. Um, and I, I want to encourage perhaps more thinking about the, the stakes of futurity in this, particularly in response of, of futurity because you've talked a lot about the, the spatial aspect um, you know, of the utopian and less about the temporal one. And you know, to your colleagues to say something like, the future is not what it used to be. Th that, that is to say that it seems there's been so much abdication on the part of an American dreamscape or a capitalist futurity of that very utopian promise. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think that reposes the stakes of the utopian, uh, particularly if one explored what are these temporal politics of the future being crushed into the present. And therefore, what, what does it mean to have a kind of refusal of debt uh, uh, and a renegotiation of that promise of a future that's particularly figured around student politics? I, I, I accept that. I mean, I think the politics of debt is going to be, I mean, you know, the news this morning was that Ireland will almost certainly default on its, you know, I think this is, this is excellent news. <laughs> it needs to be, we need to mobilize around questions of debt. But I agree with that. I've been very short now. I want to ask, actually, to, to come back somehow to dance, maybe. Uh, dance, but, okay. Yeah. Ask this guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's you. Um, I, I want to speak about, about demonstrations um, oh, which right. are happening on, on a, somehow on a, a ritual term. I would maybe refer to the 1st of May riots that are happening every year in Kreuzberg, in Berlin, actually as, as, as a festive event, as, as, a, as a like street party, you know, in which everyone are repeating the same choreographies again and again on, on the side of the demonstrators who are 
representing again, but actually just presenting icons of, of violence and of resistance. And what is the role of this kind of, um, this rite of spring in which, in which violence is being, on one hand, instrumentalized into uh, the life of the law, because like the day after everyone will pay their, you know, the fines. But um, in the same time, what is the political importance of this kind of reappearing of violence? I think it's important. There's a paper on the right of spring by Ramsey, right? Interesting that you mentioned, it. I was talking to Ramsey yesterday, he's gonna talk about the relationship between the, 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 the production of the right of spring in London and, and the suffragette protest. So I think it is, there's a direct correlation and it's, it's hugely important. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's all, it, it's hugely important um, and it's also linked to what Gerald was saying about the need for the links between dance and forms of military discipline. I mean, and the ambiguity of that, which takes us back to the question of violence. I mean, it, it, it's, um, again, I mean, I'm not celebrating violence, <laughs> uh, but the, the, it, there's a sense in which um, I'm trying to think about the, uh, the passage from nonviolent process to, to forms of violence historically, and then thinking, trying to think about it conceptually. And um, on the one hand, we have, as it were, uh, a certain principle purity of nonviolence as an ethical position, as, and then we have people who would proclaim the vi violence all the way down, right? The, sort of the Zizek position. And there needs to be some sort of third articulation of the problem, it seems to me. Um, I'm very close to Judith Butler. On, she's trying to think about this question quite hard and also using the same resources. In terms of, shut up. Stop. Okay, this actually fits quite well, but um, because you rejected, uh, let's say, Leninism when it comes to that question, I wanted to ask you if you would accept a small portion of Maoism. Because there's this wonderful... Uh, accept a small portion of nihilism? Uh, no, no, Maoism. Maoism, okay. Uh, because there's this wonderful... Um, sentence in Mao where it says, we don't love the war, but we're not afraid of it. Um, this seems to be quite a principle which can deal with both sides you described. Uh, you're not afraid <clears throat> of war. That means one can defend a collective construction without falling back into either the abstract principle of pure violent means uh -huh. or uh, the negation of, or uh, the abstract principle of nonviolent means. Okay. Um. I think I agree. I mean, I, I'd worry about, I mean, for me, it's a question of, um, <clears throat> uh, of um, it's a question of trying to separate ideas of political sovereignty from certain classical ideas of subjectivity. Right? And it seems to me that uh, the classical idea of the political subject as, as a virile subject that can, the subject that can act, that can make a decision in the most extreme case, is something that has to be disentangled. And so I'm with, uh, I'm with a line of thought you find in the late Derrida, where he's trying to separate unconditionality from sovereignty, and, and a line of thought you can also find in, in, in late Bataille, and also I think in Judith Butler's work, where it becomes a question of, as it were, renouncing a certain potentiality at the level of the political subject, and, and, and the cultivation of a, of a powerlessness and a vulnerability which does not lead to passivity and giving up on the contrary, at least to a different understanding of what a political subject might be. And I guess my suspicion of um, the masculinist politics of Leninism, Maoism, would also turn back to that question of the political subject. Um, it fits a bit to the last question or to the question before from Frank. Um, actually, I wondered what, what you w would do out of the necessity or if you see a necessity of two categories for your concept of politics, mm -hmm. which would be um, the political enemy and the question of organization. Because right. if, I, if I understood you correctly, um, as you conceived of the infinite as an opening of the situation, I wondered if there's not a difference if one would conceive of the infinite uh, not as an opening of the situation, but rather as a starting point, as an impossible starting point for an organization, which would nevertheless have, still have a political enemy. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. I, um, the infinite as the opening of a situation would be articulated maybe in the first instance around the conception of a political enemy. Yeah, 
so to that extent, there's a residual Schmittianism in this, this approach. Um, so I don't think it, it, it's, I think that's, that's essential. It becomes a question of, of how, how one can craft. Um, uh, so there's no politics without an enemy, right? But that doesn't sign me up to the rest of what Schmidt says. But I, I agree with that. And also, but, but I agree with, and the, for me, organization, again, this is something which, again, it depends where you, where you're coming from, but uh, Oliver has had to leave, but <clears throat> we're both from Essex. And uh, Essex was the homeland of a certain Gramscian left, right, with people like Leclerc. And that's just the way I tend to think, right? And, 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 the, and that tradition has been underrepresented in the German-speaking world, to my mind, which has led to certain disfigured accounts of Marxism, to my, in my humble opinion, right? Um, so for me, it's a question, of, the question of hegemony is the question of, of organization, the building of a common front, of a common force, in relationship and against an enemy, always, uh, and that and that means um, and that means forming the alliances, making the compromises, doing the pragmatic work that groups like the Invisible Committee are not willing to do, which is why they always lose. Right? So, although I recognise the the seduction of the the Marcionite desire for secession, exodus, right, that has to be that that can be. Uh, that could be a moment in a political strategy when the plebeians leave Rome, right? It's a moment in a political strategy, but unless it's linked to uh, the wider formation of a hegemonic front, then it's, it, it, then it's confined to a moralistic position, and that is not politics. all these utopias and experiments in uh, uh, political thinking and shaping community and so on and um, like uh, yeah, during the 20th century and the ref uh, you had a lot of references to the 60s and yes uh, that is uh, in a way my concern uh, actually uh, you didn't make any reference uh, uh, to the communist countries of the of the 19th century uh, and maybe especially for example former yugoslavia would be a kind of uh, challenging example or maybe something that can or that could give some answers to uh, to the question so my, my question is actually simple why didn't you make any references is it something that is irrelevant to your no, it's uh, just ignorance or, on my part or, just my... Pff, i don't know because i am from this part but no it's just just my ignorance i mean it's just my ignorance but how would it change the the formulation of the problem in your view she needs the mic she, I've got, I've got, oh, sorry the mic back give her the mic back I mean, so, so my, my perspective is limited, I Actually, uh, I don't have any like, uh, uh, answers, but uh, what I think is that uh, if we include uh, these uh, real, um, uh, realizations of the utopia that we really had, uh, that it will give us some answers without maybe so many speculations, because some things really happen, for example. That's, uh, that's why I'm asking uh, this question. Especially, I mentioned Yugoslavia, not because I'm from Yugoslavia, but because it was a really a kind of 50-year long experiment in, uh, uh, in thinking community. And maybe we already had uh, many of these questions in, at the level of, uh, um, of uh, shaping the society that was new and that was, uh, in a way, um, planned to be new and experimental and so on. Maybe you don't know the history of Yugoslavia, it's not uh, my point now, but I know that we had, that's why I was just wondering, like, uh, uh, for example, also the questions of violence and uh, uh, violence as a, kinds of, uh, uh, as a kind of defense of utopia and uh, this kind of infinite uh, demands and I don't know, that's... Uh, I mean, my, my perspective is limited by my ignorance, and uh, I, I've been I've spent time in different parts of the former Yugoslavia, and in particular, I had some very interesting experiences in Belgrade about about four years ago, when we were talking about politics. Um, but I couldn't really assemble that into anything coherent. But it's something that I, um, I mean, again, it, it, what, it, I mean to make a different point. <clears throat> so I accept I accept what you're saying completely. It's just a question of I need to learn more. Um, what, again, what's, one of the things that interests me about the, um, uh, the anarchist tradition in political thought, which is so uh, denigrated in many areas, is its, uh, its geography. Its geography, which is Slavic and Latin, rather than Germano, Anglo, American. 
which is the, as it were, the trajectory of Marxism, which makes perfect sense. Is why it, Marxism makes, does such good business academically, right? Because it gives you a coherent system and it gives you plenty to interpret and, and argue about. Whereas there's a different sort of geography of, the, um, of politics and a different sort of uh, arc. I mean, obviously, the, the, major, uh, the major theorists of, of anarchism are, are Russian, right? And it comes out of a different set of experiences, which I, uh, I think are hugely important. And it's, you know, I, I, I find, because what I find, you know, um, uh, it, it would require a, a different understanding of 19th and 20th century political thought than the one that we normally get. Right? Um. Thank you. Very, very much. So we're finally off to the lunch break and we'll break. continue at 2.30 as announced, so please try and be here. Um, we split up the groups um, into the two conferences after lunch break, so the uh, dance, politics and community will stay here, whereas the uh, thinking, reading the polit politics will go over to Margarete Bibersal, which is just opposite, across the road. 2.30, thank you very much. Oh, the, the, speakers, the speakers, if they want to have lunch, they will follow me. Okay? Thank you.